You know, recently I was reminded of the heart of what our neighborhood vision is really all about. When we were celebrating my son Ben's fourth birthday, we laid out all of his gifts that morning and he came down so excited to see all that he'd gotten. And right as he sees them, he turned to his older brother and he said, I'm going to share all of these gifts with you, brother. Oh, that's so cute. I love Ben. Yes, he's pretty fantastic. Now, while I wish that my kids were always that kind and generous to each other, in the moment, it was a great picture to me of the kind of life that God has called his church to. See, God has poured his love and his grace into our lives, his gifts, not just for our own benefit, but so that we can in turn, as his people, become a blessing to our neighbors, to share what he's done in us with them. Exactly, and in this year, we have seen the generosity and love of our God continue to grow here amongst our Chapel Street family. And we believe that this campus is the next step forward in continuing to share the good news of Christ with our neighbors. See, that's what God's plan for us is as his church that we would give our hearts to loving and serving our neighbors, seeking their welfare and praying for them. This is how God grows his kingdom and makes an impact by working in the hearts of his people, like you and me, to make us a blessing to our neighbors. There are so many ways we believe God is going to do that here in North Aurora, from regular weekly worship to unique opportunities during this week to get involved in the lives of our neighbors. Just as we see this building behind us being built up, God is building the next step of kingdom impact here at Chapel Street. Chapel Street family, this project is about so much more than myself or Jen or those who will soon join us here. This is God's call to all of us who call Chapel Street our home to consider how we might be a part of what he's continuing to do in our midst. I want to invite you to continue praying for us as Jen and I begin to prepare a core team to help lead ministry here at Chapel Street North Aurora. Pray that God would draw us as a team together and that he would draw in the right people to help make an impact right where we are. Please pray that God would open up opportunities for us to keep getting to know our neighbors and connecting the community around our new campus. And please continue to prayerfully consider how you might support this next step in our neighborhood vision. God's writing this next chapter of his story here at Chapel Street through the faithful generosity and service of families just like yours. We are so grateful for your encouragement and your support and we can't wait to show you what's next here at Chapel Street North Aurora. See you See soon. soon. Well, hey, we're so glad you chose to join us, whether you're watching us at our Mill Creek campus or online, we're just glad that you're with us. And I hope you heard what Pastor Andrew said there, that this fourth campus initiative is not just about those who will go there in North Aurora. It's about all of us, because here at Chapel Street Church, we're committed to being a family of neighborhood churches. And we've been talking about that. Many of you have been praying about that and contributing to that. And if, if you're willing, let me tell you about a way that you can contribute if you haven't already done so. We have a generous donor who's offered to match 50% of what's left on the project, $1.1 million, which means if we raise $550,000, we can launch that campus totally debt-free. I'm thrilled to tell you that we're almost to $400,000 given already to this project, so we're almost there. So if you haven't done so and you call Chapel Street Church your home, would you consider prayerfully what you might give because you know that your gift is going to be doubled for the sake of the gospel and God's kingdom. Thanks for being part of the journey with us. Now let's, let's seek God and ask him to bless us as we come to his word. Father, thank you for the way you pour out your grace in our lives. Thank you for the privilege it is to be part of building your kingdom here at Chapel Street Church. We know we're just a small part of what you're doing in the world, but we want to play our part well. And so give us your grace. Now, Lord, as we come to your word, open our eyes, as the psalmist tells us, that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. Open our ears that we might hear your spirit speak to us. Open our hearts that we might have the courage to obey what you teach us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're in a series called Living Hope on the letter of First Peter. Peter's talking to first century believers living in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, about how to live out their faith in a culture that's increasingly hostile to the claims of Christ and the gospel. And that's relevant for us because many of us feel like, how do we navigate our culture that often doesn't get Jesus, misunderstands him, and doesn't really uh, align with, with our worldview? How do we live out our faith in a joyful but authentic way? And I wanna begin now by asking you this question. How would you live if you knew your time on earth was short? How would you live if you knew that your time on earth was short? Recently, um, a good friend and former teammate of mine in college, uh, we played football together. He came back from the mission field during COVID and let some of us know that he had been diagnosed with late stage brain cancer. And so many of us who were on the team with him at that time over 25 years ago, 
we've started to get together on these Zoom prayer calls to pray for him and to get updates on how he's doing. And I'll never forget the first Zoom prayer call with all of our old teammates, and we all look a lot older than we did when we played. My friend Jeff said, you know, this diagnosis radically changes what you think is really important in life. And then not long ago, just a little over two years ago, a dear friend named Laura from our own church reached out to let my wife and I know that she'd been diagnosed with bulbar ALS. And amidst all the fear and the worry and the prayer for healing, she said something I'll never forget on that phone call. She said, Jeff, whatever comes, I just want to glorify God through it. And I can tell you that she is. God is being glorified in the midst of it. But how would you live if you knew your time on earth was short? Maybe you're saying, well, how short, Pastor Jeff? I mean, how, how long do I have? Well, w without worrying about the specific days, if you knew that it was, you know, two years or less, what would you do? Would you make your bucket list of things to see and places to go and people to visit? Would you empty out your bank account and give it all away? Or maybe you'd go off to Vegas? Or What, what changes would you make to your life and why if you knew your time was short? In our series here, Peter's been encouraging first century Christians and us to faithfully live for Christ in a culture that's increasingly at odds with our faith. And he's saying also, don't be discouraged by that. Don't see that as a, as a disappointment. In fact, that's historically the way it's always been. People apart from God are opposed to the gospel. And you're not, it's not new to you and it's not new to us. And here he's been telling us how we should live this way. In chapter 2, verse 12, he says that we should let the world see through our lives, our humble, submitted lives, the character of Christ. In chapter 3, verse 15, he says we should let the world hear from us when we say and declare the reason for the, an the answer, for the reason for the hope that we have. Now we're moving to chapter 4, and Peter's going to talk about how to put this kind of Christian life in perspective, realizing that as Christ followers, our days are numbered. Our time here is relatively short. The clock is ticking for all of us. So we're going to read the first six verses from 1 Peter chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now that's a pretty complicated passage, but there's some powerful things in here for us. You know, people take a very different approach to how they think about the future. Some of you are planners and strategizers. Others of you like to go with the flow. Peter says, regardless, if you're a Christ follower, you are to arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. He's using military imagery there. Arm yourselves. Mental preparation. He's talking about a kind of mental, spiritual discipline that helps you live the way God wants you to live. With the same way of thinking. Well, well what way of thinking? He means Jesus, Christ's way of thinking. Because Christ suffered on your behalf. He too faced persecution and suffering. And so your mind should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean you're omniscient, but it means you think and you see the world through Jesus' lenses, as it were. And that prepares you. Now, few of us, if any, will ever suffer in anything like the way of these first century believers. And but actually, at the time Peter wrote this, state-sponsored persecution from Emperor Nero had not yet broken out in the Roman world. It was soon to happen, but it hadn't yet. Nevertheless, they knew what it was like to be maligned, to be marginalized, to be mocked, to be sidelined for their faith, to be viewed by the culture as strange or even as a problem. And that's relevant for us. And whatever the case, Peter says, we too are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. Now, in the second half of verse 1, Peter says that, um, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, what does that mean? Does he mean that we become sinless when we suffer? No, not at all. There's only one who is sinless, Jesus Christ, the perfect one. What he's saying is suffering refines us, it purifies us, and he's saying if you choose to endure hardship or suffer because of Jesus, that's a clear indication that you've made a break from your old life of sin. Like the old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. 
no turning back. You've, we've made a choice, in other words. I could go with the flow and not endure suffering and just renounce my faith and of course, live under the radar. But if I choose to live for Christ, it will inevitably cost me something. And so he's saying, essentially, the ceasing from sin is I've ceased from living that way. Not that we don't ever sin or struggle, we do. But I've made a break with my old life, is what he's saying. And that's what gets us to verse 2. He says, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Let me put it to you this way. The defining moment of the Christian life is not, you know, some uh, inspiring sermon, although I believe in inspiring sermons. It's not some mountaintop mission trip experience as powerful as those may be. The defining moment for most of us as Jesus followers is how do we respond when it costs us something to follow him? That's when the rubber meets the road, and we know this is real. And what Peter's saying here is essentially, your time is limited. So I'm going to use a little drawing here because Peter's really giving us, one, because I think the board is cool, but also because Peter's really giving us the fact, three clocks, as it were. So the first one we'll talk about is your time. He's saying that, you know, the clock is ticking on your life. That our time is limited. It's fixed. It's finite. And literally, in the text here, what Peter says is, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Meaning, literally it means the time that is past is enough for that behavior. You, you might translate this literally, enough already, Peter says. You don't have time to waste living that way. Don't waste any more time. You've wasted enough time in those things. And if you think about that list Peter gives us, debauchery, drunkenness, and all and sexual sin, it's the same garbage we still struggle with today. From first century to 21st century, it's the same stuff. And Peter's saying, enough. That time is past. It's enough. The clock is ticking for all of us. You know, I, I recently was watching a, a rugby match on uh, some obscure channel on cable, and I, the, the, the British commentators were saying that, so uh, the penalty box, or when you commit or get a yellow card, we call that in hockey the penalty box. I'm not sure in rugby what the actual term is, but the commentators were saying it's the sin bin. They kept calling it the sin bin. And I, at first I wasn't sure what they're saying about the sin bin, then I started thinking about that. If you're in the sin bin, I wish I could imitate their accent, I think they were New Zealand actually, if you're in the sin bin, you're not in the game. You're out. And there's a sense in which Peter's saying is, God wants you in the game for his sake and his glory and for your good. Don't waste any more time in the sin bin. It's not worth it, he's saying. And, and he goes on then uh, in the text and talks about their lives. In verse 4, he says, For the time is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And he says, When you don't join them, they malign you for this. They mock you for this. But they too will give an account, he says. They're going to give an account for their own lives. So this is the second clock. This is the clock that we might call their time. Their clock is also ticking. Everybody who's on earth has a clock, right? And they're all ticking on us. We're not going to live eternally in this earthly life. There's a fixed point in which we're, which we're all going to die. And God knows that, even if you and I don't know that when that is for us. So, and the relationship between these two clocks is critical. Because what Peter's been saying is the way you live your life, the way you use your time on earth, can impact their time. How, what their eternity is like. You don't have time to waste here. Not only for your sake and God's glory, but for their sake. Now, to live your life any other way than sold out for Christ is wasting your time. Let me just talk to you. If you're in high school for a minute, you ever stop to think you only get one chance to live a sold out life for Jesus as a high school student. I think back on my years in high school and I really didn't come to deep faith in Christ until toward the end of my high school years. and I didn't seize that moment. You only get one chance if you're in college to live as a college student sold out for Christ. You only get one chance in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s. Those seasons are behind you eventually. Seize that moment, Peter's saying. Use your time to glorify God. Let me put it to you this way. We'll go back in a simple statement. 
We'll come back to this drawing in a minute. But a simple statement to put it this way. Your life on earth is a gift from God that you are meant to use for his purpose and his glory. That's it. He's given you the days and numbered them for his, for his purpose and his glory. To live any other way is a waste of time. Don't waste your time. Now, in verse 6 is curious. In verse 6, I'll just read it again here for us. He says, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Some have taken this to mean, oh, oh, after you die, you get a second chance to believe in Jesus. That's not what Peter's saying. The whole letter is calling people to faithfully follow Christ in the midst of persecution and suffering. It wouldn't make any sense if he says, well, after you die, you get to re a redo. No, you have one life. Hebrews chapter 9 says it's appointed for a man or woman once to die, and after that comes judgment. This life is headed somewhere. It means something. What he's saying is there are people, remember their clock? There are people who are dead in their sin, and there are people who have died, and the gospel is continually needs to be preached to them so that though we all die in the flesh, they might live with Christ in the Spirit. You only get that one chance, he's saying. Peter's talking about the urgency of how we live our lives and share the gospel. So let's move to the next section of the text, 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things as it is at hand. That sounds ominous, doesn't it? The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a passage. You should go back and read over and pray through verses 7 through 11. He begins by saying, the end of all things is at hand. So let's go back to our little drawing for a minute. Remember we talked about the three clocks. There's three clocks that Peter gives us. First, there's your time, my time. There's their time. And then there is what we'll call his time. That all of our time exists. And this is not a perfect circle, so forgive that. But this exists inside of God's time. The end of all things is at hand. That his, he lives in eternity, and he set us, our finite lives, inside of his eternal sovereign will. And he says, the end of all things is at hand. We'll go back here for just a minute. And he's teaching us then how to live in light of the end. How do we live in light of the end? And he gives us three simple things. Before we get into these, let me just say, how do you think we should live in light of the end? How do you observe Christians living in light of the end, or non-Christians? Uh, i got to be honest, we don't, we don't get this right very often. I, I see people that are uh, living in light of the end, we, we're fasting with the end times. When's the end? Books written predicting the date and then rewritten to interpret why they were not wrong about the date when the date came and went. YouTube channels galore on prophecies and reinterpreting imagery and why 666 applies to some politician we don't like. And craziness abounds trying to live in light of the end of all things. But that's not what Peter's saying here. He doesn't tell us to do any of that stuff. Here's what he says. Fascinating how simple and profound it is. First, he says pray. Right here in the text. Therefore, be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. There's a particular kind of prayer life we're to have. Clear-eyed, clear-headed, not freaking out, not praying wacky stuff, but focused on Christ, self-controlled because we know our time is limited, and laser focus on Jesus in our prayers and what his agenda is. The first thing Peter says, you want to live a life in light of the end of all things? Pray. Be a praying people. Be a praying church. Isn't that good? It's so simple but so profound. That's how we're to live in light of the end. Keep our minds clear, our lives self-controlled, and pray. And then in verse 8, he says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. This is the second thing. Love. <laughs> what could be simpler but some, so difficult for us sometimes? Live in light of the end. Pray. Pray. 
and love. Love each other earnestly. Now, Peter's not saying when he says that love covers a multitude of sins, he's not saying that, that love sweeps all sin under the rug or love ignores injustice. No, not at all. Here's what he's saying. When you love each other earnestly, you believe the best about each other. 1 Corinthians 13, love believes all things. You are less defensive than you otherwise would be. You're, you're not as easily offended as you ordinarily would be. You don't hold grudges. You give each other the benefit of the doubt. Where love is lacking, every word and every action is, is questioned or doubted or viewed with suspicion. And every motive is, uh, is you know, questioned and brought into, into doubt. I've noticed this during the COVID season. We've been isolated at times from each other, distanced from each other. It's starting to change now. We're seeing each other more, and I praise God for that. But there was a season when we were under quarantine, a long season during this last year, when I noticed tangibly, it was, it was, it was visible, that people stopped believing the best about each other. All they saw was something on social media, or I heard this person believes that, or said this, or voted this way, or whatever. And you know that person. You love that person. They love Jesus like you do, but yet there's bitterness and anger and distrust and suspicion. Why? P Peter, it's very wise what Peter says here. In living in light of the end means love, because it covers each other, even when we don't get things right. And then in verse 10, he says, use your gifts, whatever gifts you've been given, to serve. This is the third thing, serve. Three things, Peter says, you wanna live a life that's in proper perspective in light of the end? Pray, love, and serve. One of the most encouraging things to me over this COVID season has been to watch Chapel Streeters, many of you, and the way that you, even though some of our, our movement was restricted and our opportunities were limited, found creative and, and wonderful ways to keep serving and loving your neighbors. And that's still going on. Think about this. The end of all things is near. What should we do? What should we do? Wring our hands? No. Pray, love, serve. Martin Luther once said, even if I knew that Jesus was to return for certain tomorrow, I would still plant my apple tree today. <laughs> I love that. I Meaning get on with life, the life God has called us to live, and trust God. Precisely because we know the one who holds the end of all things. You know, there's a difference between the end of all things and the end of your things. The end of all things, we don't know. Was Peter wrong when he said the end of all things is near? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Did he get that wrong? No, because when Christ rose from the dead, we entered into what is called the last days. First Peter chapter 1 tells us this, living in the last days. We're still living in those days. We're still living with the end of all things approaching. But even when we, though we don't know the end of all things, the end of your things may, co is, may come soon for all of us. That's our clock again. The point is that we learn to live in light of the end. Okay, now, the last part of chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is such an important passage. Honestly, we could have spent a sermon on each section here independently. But when it comes to suffering, Peter is he's saying, okay, now that you know, if we go back for just a moment to our drawing of the times... He said, now that you have this perspective, living your time in light of his time, the end of all things, how do you endure suffering when it comes? What should our response be? You know, we are such an avoidance culture when it comes to suffering. We, we have industries designed around this. As Christians, we have to put this whole discussion of suffering into its proper perspective. 
it's what theologians call eschatology, the Greek word eschaton um, or eschatos, meaning the end, the end of all things. So eschatology means the study of the end times. Well, what's the point of that? Again, not to get caught up in the weeds, but that we might live today with trust and faith. You see, how you think about the end has everything to do with how you live in the present. That's what it's for. Now, Peter did not always have this perspective, by the way. Peter it was not always this clear-eyed about how we should live in light of the end. In fact, in Mark chapter 8, there's this fascinating back-to-back story where Jesus asks the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they're all confused. The people don't know. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you got that one right. And then the very next story, Jesus says, the Son of Man, meaning himself, must be betrayed to the hands of sinful men and tortured and crucified. And the text says that Peter took Jesus aside, Peter, and rebuked him because Jesus was talking about his own suffering. (laughs) Think about that. Peter went from professing Jesus as Lord and Christ to rebuking him for talking about suffering. It's bad for morale, Jesus. Quit talking about suffering so much. You're bringing me down. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter back and put him in his place. And in John 21, uh, Peter has been reinstated after his failure denying Christ. And Jesus, at the end of that beautiful exchange, Jesus says to Peter, you will be led where you don't want to go when you're old. To indicate the kind of death he was to die, Peter would be crucified upside down uh, under the Roman persecution. And Peter, in John 21, his response is, okay, it may be to me as you have said, no. You know what he says? But Lord, what about that guy? Meaning John. (laughs) That's so us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay, but what about, what about, what about, what about? But Peter's learned a few things, and he's going to give us four resources or principles that will help us to make sense of suffering, how to make sense of suffering. You know, suffering can either harden our hearts, cause us to question God's goodness, drive us from him, or it can soften us and deepen us and strengthen our faith in a way that nothing else can. C.S. Lewis famously in his book, The Problem of Pain, says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So here's the first resource. Don't be surprised. Peter says it right there in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. This is such a relevant word for us. Don't let this shock you. Don't let it catch you off guard. It's to be expected. Jesus says this very thing in John chapter 15. He says, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And if they persecute you, it's because of me, remember. That's the key. Don't act like this is bad news. It might be hard. It might be painful. It might be difficult. But it doesn't mean something's wrong with God or something's wrong with you. It probably means if you're suffering for Christ that you're identified with him. Don't be surprised. The word fiery trial literally means the ordeal, the testing, the refining. So don't be surprised when it comes because it came for Jesus. And if you identify with him, it might come for you too. Second, rejoice. Rejoice in Jesus. Peter says this. Uh, He says that we are to rejoice if you're insulted for the name of Christ and we're blessed by the spirit of glory and we're to rejoice in him. This is a hard one. It's not the power of positive thinking. Peter's not saying, you know, just pretend like it doesn't hurt. Pretend like everything's fine. You know, sometimes we think that we have to come to church and put on a face and act like we're just fine when we're not just fine. I'll never forget, years ago, I asked this man uh, who was walking. I said, hey, Nick, how are you? And he said, you really want to know? I was like, "Uh, yeah, I I guess. Sure, (laughs) I was just asking. And he launched into this really difficult, painful story of what what he'd been going through. And he said he prayed that morning on the way to church, I'm not pretending anymore, Lord. If somebody asks me, I'm going to tell them the truth. And he did. Why do we pretend? Don't be surprised. Rejoice. Now, it doesn't mean rejoice in the pain. It means rejoice in the midst of it because you're in Christ. Rejoice in the one who suffered for you. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, Peter's one of these, the, the disciples, the apostles who are tortured and then released, warned, don't preach in the name of Jesus. They w- went out rejoicing, not because they'd been beaten, but because they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. This brings us to the third resource Peter gives us, glorify his name. Glorify his name. In verse 16, he puts it very clearly. He says to us, that we are, let a, none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or a meddler. In other words, your suffering needs to be for Jesus. 
Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, this is one of only three times the word Christians use in the New Testament. Christ, it means Christ one, one identified with Jesus. They didn't have words for him. They just called the Jesus people, the Christ ones. If you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The name with which you're identified. If you suffer as a Christian, a Christ one, then bring glory to God in the very name under which you suffer. His name, Jesus' name. That's what he's saying. In verse 14, he says, the spirit of glory rests on you. This is so important. God doesn't abandon you in your pain. The spirit of glory rests on you in a way that, that's powerful, in a way that maybe it doesn't feel the same when times are easy. I've never heard anybody in my life say, the most important lessons in my life I've learned through ease and comfort and security. No. It's always come through difficulty, pain, and struggle, even suffering. And here we're told that when this happens to us, of whatever kind, the spirit of glory rests on you, that you might bring him glory. Remember Laura's prayer when she was diagnosed with ALS? I just want to see God glorified. Of course she wants to be healed, and I've been praying for that. Many people are. Of course she wants to have her days prolonged. But the clock's ticking for all of us, and I love what she said. I'll never forget it. I just want to bring God glory. Whatever comes, however long it lasts. Finally, Peter tells us to entrust your soul to God. Verse 19 can only be claimed if we're living the way that the first part of the chapter lays it out for us. Verse 19 is such a powerful verse. One more time. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Meaning, remember, remember that? Pray, love, serve, doing good. Keep praying, keep loving, keep serving. And while you do that, entrust your soul to God. Leave it to him. He made you. He loves you. He knows all the days ordained for you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows how, how much time you have. He knows when the end of all of your things will come and when the end of all things comes. He holds it all. So you can pray, love, serve, and entrust your soul to your creator. The one who suffered for you and in your place. What better way for us to remind ourselves of the hope we have in Jesus than by celebrating communion, coming to his table. Jesus, the suffering servant, the one who suffered in our place and who's with us in our own pain and difficulty. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to come to his table. Father God, thank you for these ancient words written to people long ago, facing persecutions that many of us, most of us, will never know. Nevertheless, they're relevant for us. We too are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking, the way of Christ. We too are called to live in light of the end of all things by praying, seeking you in prayer, by loving people, by serving others and you. And we too, Lord, when we face difficulty and persecution and hardship because we're identified with your name, teach us, Lord, not to be surprised. Teach us to rejoice in you. Teach us to glorify your name and to trust our souls to you. And now, Lord, as we come to your table, we acknowledge that we fall short of this. We're broken people. We get it wrong. Thank you that on the cross you set us right. You did for us what we could not do for ourselves. You've given us what we could never earn the hope not just in this life, but for all eternity, that at the end of all things, we'll be with you in glory because of your son, Jesus. Prepare us now as we come to your table. We pray in his name. Amen.